Let's now look at wave functions that define p orbitals. They occur when the quantum number L is equal to 1. Looking at the angular part of the hydrogen atom solution, y as a function of theta and phi, the three solutions are the square root of 3 over 4 pi times cosine theta and the square root of 3 over 8 pi times sine theta e raised to the power of plus or minus i phi where the plus or minus is related to whether or not m is plus 1 or minus 1. The solution to y01 is the pz orbital, since it is real and it is oriented along the z-axis. Since y plus or minus 1, 1 is complex, they do not directly translate into the px and py orbitals. It's customary to use combinations of these two solutions. So the px orbital is actually defined as 1 over the square root of 2, times y11 plus y negative 11, and that's equal to the square root of 3 over 4 pi times sine theta cos phi. The py orbital is typically defined as 1 over the square root of 2 times y11 minus y minus 11, and that's equal to the square root of 3 over 4 pi sine theta sine phi. Looking at the sine theta cos phi and sine theta sine phi result for px and py respectively should make sense as these were the same trig identities that converted x and y to spherical polar coordinates when we migrated from a Cartesian basis in the rotational spectroscopy lecture. Let's now look at a second problem where we're trying to understand where an electron might live. In this case, we're just going to look at it now in terms of a pz orbital. And so the question in this case is now, what is the probability of finding an electron within a sphere of radius r centered on the nucleus if the electron is in a pz orbital? And what that looks like is we could draw our three Cartesian axes, so here's x, y, and z, just to get a sense of spatial reality. And our pz orbital looks like a dumbbell, and it's going to be centered on the origin, and it's going to be symmetric above and below the x, y plane. And the question is asking if we were to draw a sphere of radius r, what is the probability of finding the electron within that sphere? And so the integral of what that looks like well that's going to be integral between 0 and r an integral between 0 and pi to add up all of our theta coordinates and it's going to be an integral between 0 and 2 pi and then we have our probability distribution function so it's psi 2pz psi star 2pz rather times psi 2pz times the volume element, so r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. So let's now substitute in for our 2pz orbital. So probability is equal to, here's that integral again, this is that circle of radius r, and so I have to add up that shell, which is the 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi integrals, and then between 0 and r, that adds up all of these shells. So like an onion, I have all these pieces that, that that's what I end up integrating over. Psi star of 2pz, well, there's no complex component in that wave function, so it's the same as psi 2pz. So I have 32 pi square root 1 over. I have a 1 over a naught raised to the power of 3 halves. I have an r over a naught term. I have an e to the negative r over 2 a naught, and I have a cosine theta. I duplicate this term, 1 over 32 pi squared, 1 over a naught, 3 halves, r over a naught, e to the negative r over 2 a naught, and to that I'm going to be multiplying cosine theta, which finishes psi of 2 pz. And then I have the volume element, r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. Now this term that I actually just substituted in for psi of 2pz, which is this 1 over square root of 32 pi times 3 halves, or 1 over a naught raised to the power of 3 halves times r over a naught times e to the negative r over 2a naught times cosine theta, 
That term is different than the one that I was talking about in the previous slide because the one that I was talking about in the previous slide was just the angular component, was just the y theta of phi. And so now in this case, I've now multiplied it by the function of r, which comes from the solution of the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. This is the part that we solved for today, and that's where the rest of these pieces came from. So my next thing to do here is to start grouping together like terms. And so I can pull out a bunch of constants up front. I have a 1 over square root 32 pi and a 1 over square root of 32 pi. I also have this a naught 3 halves and this a naught 3 halves and I also have an a naught here and an a naught here on the bottom. So all of that can come out front. And so what I end up with is 32 pi a naught raised to the power of 5. I then I'm going to get, I'm going to group together all of my terms of r. So I have a term of r there, I have an exponential with terms of r there, I have a term of r there and an exponential with terms of r, and I have an r squared there. So r's, just on their own, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, so the, hence I get an r to the power of 4. And these two exponential terms, well, I can, when I multiply them together, I add up the term and their exponents, and so I have negative r over 2a0 plus negative r over 2a0, so it's essentially 1 half plus 1 half is 1, so that gives me an e to the negative r over a0 and I'll carry through the dr. My second integral has to deal with theta, and so my terms of theta, well I have a cosine theta, a cosine theta, and a sine theta, and a d theta. So that means then, I, since I've got two cosine thetas, I get a cosine squared theta times sine theta d theta, and then finally I have an integral over phi. And the only term in phi that I have is my d phi. So I will just write that integral right at the end. So then evaluating these three integrals and then multiplying them together will be our strategy to solve this, this problem. And so the first one that we're going to solve is this rightmost one, this integral in terms of phi. And principally it's because it's the most straightforward one because if we take the, the integral of d phi we end up with just getting phi evaluated between 0 and 2 pi, which is pretty straightforward. The second integral is this middle one, this one in terms of theta. This one actually looks somewhat difficult, but it really is straightforward. If we look at the antiderivative of this, we can reason that that integral is actually just going to be negative cosine cubed theta over 3 and that will be evaluated between 0 and pi. And if we were to take the derivative of, of that term, you would end up getting back cosine squared theta, sine theta, d theta. And so that's why we can right away just write in that term. The final one, which is this term, or this integral in terms of r, well this one will require us to do integration by parts, and we would have to do four iterations of that. And so rather than doing that all for you today right here, I will just give you the solution, since this is something that is readily available on Wolfram Alpha or some other integration software. But the solution to that integral is e to the negative r over a naught, negative 24 a naught raised to the power of 5, minus 24 a naught raised to the power of 4 times r, minus 12 a naught cubed times r squared, minus 4 a naught squared r cubed minus a naught times r raised to the power of 4. And of course up front I'm going to still maintain this 1 over 32 pi a naught raised to the power of 5. The final thing that I've forgotten to write down here of course is the bounds of my integration which is between 0 and r.